doctorate at the Walgreens Pharmacy, um, which is just down the road from where Melanie's children went to preschool. But the prescription pad was that of Dr. Brad Miller, who was Melanie's boss. So the light bulb goes off and they're thinking right away, clearly Melanie had access to this prescription pad. She used it, she filled it. Chloral hydrate was necessary for this defendant to have control, and even more importantly, it was necessary to her that Bill McGuire had no control. Dr. Miller looked at the prescription and he said, that's not my signature and it appears to be Melanie McGuire's handwriting. Prosecutors also focused on what they said Melanie was doing in the days before her husband's disappearance. For that, they looked at the McGuire's home computer. We had it forensically examined, and it really was just astounding seeing what the internet searches were for. Can you uh, describe the searches that you recovered? How to purchase guns illegally? how to commit murder, and undetectable poisons was searched. It didn't look good. It looked like someone was searching how to, you know, sedate someone or how to kill them. I'm a nurse. I was a nurse. And I don't need to look up things like that. If I wanted to look for something like that, I have a PDR, a Physician's PDR, Desk Records. I have a book that, that I can look in. That doesn't leave an internet, doesn't internet history. history. But both Melanie but both and Melanie Bill Melanie use this computer. So it's really hard to figure out who was searching these things. Now, you have absolutely no, no idea of knowing who actually conducted the search that you talked about, correct? No, I don't. He didn't commit suicide. He didn't shoot himself. He correct. wasn't able to carve his own body up. And yet there's a It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Although investigators found no physical evidence in the McGuire's home, they did find something significant in Bill McGuire's car. After Bill's car was recovered in Atlantic City, our criminalist was able to locate several pieces of small flesh. These pieces of flesh are an artifact of Bill McGuire's body being disarticulated. The phrase was used, human sawdust. Human sawdust is a term that did not exist until this case, as I understand it. I found particles that, to me, look like it could be possibly human tissue. DNA results, DNA results indicated that the flesh belonged to Bill McGuire. What this really was, was a few pieces of microscopic skin cells that were a little bit deeper than the skin we passively shed. Could those tissues, the tissue that you looked at, be shed from a live human being? It cannot be shed from a live human being. It's not a typical shedding process at all. Their theory was that this nurse who was kind of so meticulous had somehow just forgotten to wipe the bottom of her shoes. That she accidentally trapped these human sawdust particles of Bill's body from the house of the car. Thank you, Your Honor. There were 81 witnesses in seven weeks. Good morning, Dr. Miller. Good morning. Dr. Miller was the testimony that everyone was most anticipating. He was going to be the big star of the trial. I was having an affair, and my whole life uh, turned upside down. Were you in love with the defendant? Now, with so much on the line, ABC I tell you that she, she went, went to Atlantic, Atlantic City, City and, and parked, parked her husband, husband Bill's car at the, at the Flamingo, Flamingo Hotel. Hotel. No, no, she did not. Did there, did there come a time, time when the defendant shared with you that she had done that? Yes, and I asked her, well, why didn't you tell me this sooner? And, and she told me that she didn't want me to be upset, that she's going back to find Bill, to bring him back, uh, and, you know, rekindle the relationship. We looked very closely at Dr. Miller. There was no evidence connecting him with this crime. 
This is in reference to consensual recordings between Brad Miller. This is in reference to consensual recordings between Brad Miller and Melanie McGuire. You agreed to consensually record a conversation with the defendant. Yes, I did. Prosecutors really wanted the jury to hear those intercepted calls so they could get a sense that maybe her desire to be with him was the motive for the murder. During the calls, uh, Dr. Miller spoke about their future together, probably prompted by detectives. After all, she the understanding between us had always been that the children came first. And he starts talking about divorce and a future and moving forward. And I even say on the tape, why are you talking like this all of a sudden? defense was also able to score some points with those recordings, which called into question Dr. Miller's character. At the time of those secret recordings, he was still having an intimate relationship with her. After you tape recorded her, sir, you then had additional intimate relations with her, correct? Yes, sir. Did you tell her that, by the way, that you had tape recorded her? No, I did not. I think that was damaging to his character and was a very big turnoff to the jury. Have you ever had contact again with Dr. Brad Miller? No. No. After the day he testified, I haven't laid eyes on him since. No desire. It's it's tough. That was a tough betrayal to to swallow. What matters is whether the state, and the burden is on me, and I welcome it, whether the state has proved each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. When you combine the computer searches, the prescription for chloral hydrate on prescription pads that the defendant used, and then you have the victim found inside their matching luggage, the bullets consistent with the gun that she purchased. There was a mountain of evidence. There's no question in my mind uh, that she did it. I also don't believe that she acted alone. Now, who helped her? Paddy Percy also told the jury that there was a very, very good chance that Melanie had an accomplice. Although he was, although he was never charged, investigators took a hard look at Melanie's stepfather, Michael Caparrero. The prosecutor needed somebody, so they focused in on me. Anything they wanted, we gave them. We gave him DNA, we gave him hair samples. I had nothing to do with anything involving that crime. You don't, you don't need the precise when, you don't need the precise where. You don't have to find that she pulled the trigger. You don't have to find that she had hands on physically in regards to his death. But boy, that leaves a lot of speculation out there for the jury. You can't guess someone into prison for the rest of their life. The jury goes into deliberation, and Melanie and her family are waiting on pins and needles. I was very concerned. I think we all as people like to believe that if someone was capable of committing this type of murder, that the person who did that would look like a monster. But sometimes, sometimes killers just look just like Melanie McGuire. The day the verdict was read, the atmosphere in the courtroom was just electric. Has the jury reached a verdict in this case? Yes, Your Honor. How do you find us with the count of the indictment charging Melanie McGuire with the murder of William McGuire? Guilty. I just remember seeing her collapse. I remember grabbing Joe's arm, and I remember feeling my legs just kind of go out from under me. She's alternating between, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, and my babies, my babies, and refer to her two children. that the maximum sentence should be imposed. Melanie is sentenced to life in prison plus five years. We're going to fight on. This is a definite setback. This is uh, round one. This is not the end of the story. This is episode 14, Direct Appeal. I see a bounty. And thanks to these two professors turned podcasters, it turns out it isn't the end of this story. How could anyone be convicted of that amount of reasonable doubt? It's stunning. Off the sentencing, Melanie McGuire.
Maguire was taken to the Edna Mann Correctional Facility in Clinton, New Jersey. Her new home would be a six by nine foot cell. It's just beginning for us now. We'll never give up. We will never, ever give up for her until the truth comes out. On direct appeal, we examine the murder conviction of Melanie McGuire. Prepaid call from Melanie McGuire. An inmate at Edna Mayen Correctional Facility. Obviously, obviously Melanie's been convicted. She's exhausted all of her appeals at this point. So how did the idea for this podcast come about? Melanie McGuire was looking to speak with someone about her story because she had done really poorly in the court system. And I think she was frustrated. And after visiting with her the first time, I was like, well, this is a story. This is important. I very difficult. It was reliving it. This was the first time somebody was basically saying, we hear you. We hear you. Would you say, let's get to the juicy part. I want to know, do you think she is innocent or guilty? In the end, I believe that Melanie McGuire was wrongfully convicted. So you believe an innocent woman is behind bars right now? Absolutely. I believe this is a case of a wrongful conviction. So let's, talk so, so let's talk about some of the questions you raise in your podcast, and let's begin with the, the gun. The gun to this day has never been recovered. One of the key witnesses for the prosecution was a forensic ballistic expert. These are two uh, discharge bullets. They're referred to as a 38 caliber lead watt cutter bullet. Is it possible that the gun Melanie bought is not actually the murder weapon? I think it's, I think it's probable. No one plugged the serial number of my gun into a website to find out what the specifications were. Apparently each gun makes something called lands and grooves. Lands and grooves are rifling characteristics that are machine pressed into the barrel of a gun. And when the bullet passes through the barrel, the same number of lands and grooves are going to be imprinted essentially onto that bullet. There were five lands and grooves that my weapon was said to have made based on the company's website. The bullets that came out of my husband had six lands and grooves. It was a mistake on a gun manufacturer. 